ओम सहना वदु भक्तु with the background of what we heard in the last class we can appreciate this verse much much better atma agnana here is avarna the covering so to speak and this is likened to a lengthy sleep why is it a lengthy sleep because it's not easy to awaken from this sleep <laughs> even though i want to awaken from this sleep there are things in the way and we saw what all the uh, are the things in the way so this is the lengthy sleep atma agnana atma agnana meva mahanidra atma agnana mahanidra that agnana itself is the nidra sleep and sleep there is a certain non awareness that's what it is so the avarna gives is non awareness of what of myself as turiya myself as satchidananda is a non awareness and it's a very costly non awareness because of this non awareness there are mistakes that are made and here the mistakes that are made is talked about by the word jrimbate asmin jaganmaye jrimbate spins projects makes creates in this jagat there is this pratyaya called mayat jagan jagat plus maya jagan maya it's a little bit of a sandhi going on so that nasalization takes place takara is replaced by the nasal of its class jaganmay the suffix maya has many meanings one is it's a modification vikar and this is the how it is used in the words annamaya pranamaya manomaya vijnanamaya It's a modification. Modification is you can't say body is food. The muffin you ate just now is not food. <laughs> it's not like a lump here. <laughs> It's I saw on the way up. It's not. <laughs> so the muffin is converted into what? nutrients mm. does not just hang out there you know this is a vikara the modification of muffin so muffin maya muffin mayam shariram your body is 
<laughs> as though a modification of the muffin. Okay. So that is one meaning. Then the other meaning is preponderance. Prachuryarthe. Like supposing if I say, if, if you ask me, how was the party? You went to somebody's birthday party. How was it? I will say, it was just food maya. Means it was full of food. <laughs> All I remember is the food. I don't remember the people. I don't remember what presents they got. In fact, I have even forgotten who the, whose birthday it was. But what I haven't forgotten is how much food was there and how much I got to eat the food and enjoy the food. Preponderance. Annamayam yanyam. How was the fire sacrifice? The fire ritual also was full of food like this. Preponderance means mostly, I remember this, mostly food. And then there is a readily used meaning called swarthe mayat in its own sense. Like chinmaya. Chit plus mayat, chinmaya. The other two meanings, it's not a vikara of chit. It's not a modification of chit. And neither is it a uh, mostly chit. If I say mostly chit, then what is it? Little bit ajit? No. <laughs> that, that doesn't... Uh, ajit means inert. So then, sentience itself, chinmaya. And so here, jaganmaya. What shall we... How we shall we... Which, which meaning shall we give it? Itself. Prach. Itself. Yeah. Prach if you give preponderance, it's mostly Jagat and little bit something else. <laughs> then you have to look for what else it is. <laughs> or if you say it's a Vikara, Vikara of what? Then if you say if it's a Vikara of Chit, then Jagat becomes real. Mm. That it is a modified form of Chit means there is Chit and there is a modification. Like milk and yogurt. Yogurt is a vikara of milk. So then there is a duality. All these things, see, every suffix we don't, uh, we fixate on every suffix. So then we have to say the last meaning, itself, swarthe, mayat. So asmin jagan maye, in this jagat, which is jagat, <laughs> in this jagat, which is glorious, which is itself, jagat means universe. In this jagat, free of jaganmaya means it is just itself. It is neither a vikara, nor is it bad, nor is it good, you can't say. It is simply itself. And in this jagat, which is simply itself, what do I do? I spin a dream for a whole series of nightmares, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm scared. <laughs> And how long is this sleep? One life, next life, third life, fourth life, fifth life. And one of the saint poetists from South India, Akka Mahadevi from Karnataka, she said that she remembered she had 84 trillion lives. So, that's a lot of lives. And that's a very long sleep. Even if you say 84 trillion lives, each life, let's, let's make it a very conservative estimate because in the olden days, people just died off very quickly. There was not, medical attention was not there. and not, So even if they died off at 50, so 50 into 84 trillion. Okay? <laughs> Do the math. <laughs> There's a lot of lives. This is assuming that as soon as one dies, one is reborn. So you don't know how many time you have spent in other uh, lokas, etc. You don't know that. So, 84 trillion <laughs> lives and in between whatever breeders have had. And all this time, what have I been doing? Sleeping and spinning. Sleeping and spinning. Spinning my 
my own personal reality and overlaying it, throwing up on the jagat, which is free of throw up. Yeah, that's why it's called projection. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing up the ragadveshas <laughs> and saying, Oh, what a terrible place. <laughs> you threw up, you threw up. <laughs> yeah, it's what it is. Your own preferences and your own prejudices you throw up over the jagat. And then you say, Oh, it's so dirty, it's so smelly, it's a terrible place to live in. That's why you have to clean up. That's why inner child work. That's why this knowledge. Sometimes, you know, you're in the supermarket and some child knocks off something. And then over the microphone, they'll say, clean up on aisle seven. <laughs> Meaning somebody please come and clean it up. <laughs> so here, clean up on life number 77. <laughs> clean up. Never too late to clean up. Clean up. And so, Vijrimbhate, Jrimbhate, throws up. This jiva throws up all over itself and then says the jagat is a terrible place to live in. Because I can't stand my own references and prejudices looking at them. Because I can't look at them dispassionately. I'm affected by them. I don't like that I have them. I don't know how to get rid of them. And they paint this world into my world of pains and sorrows. Vijrimbate. Jrimbate or Vijrimbate? Both are okay. Jrimbate. Jrimbate asmin jagan maye. And then what Jrimbate? And, and for this Jrimbanam, for this uh, projection, what, are, what is the ingredient should be there? Dirgha Swapna should be there. Dirgha Swapna means a long, long, very, 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 very long sleep. The sleep of ignorance. Self-ignorance. The sleep of self-ignorance is my problem. And in this sleep, I start cooking up my own universe using as raw materials my own unconscious mind. My unconscious mind becomes the raw material for the jagat that I am going to create. And this order of reality is called the subjective order of reality. In Sanskrit, it is called pratibhasikam. Pratibhasikam jagat, my own jagat. And then, of course, all the pains and sorrows cannot be listed here. This is, after all, a poetry. It's a poem. So, he categorizes everything. All the objects of projection are categorized here into two. In this long sleep of self-ignorance are projected two things. What are they? Both of them are delusional. So, Delusional things are projected, which can be characterized as pravritti-based pursuit and nivritti-based pursuits. Pravritti means approach, running towards. So two kinds of pursuits are there. One is what? Whatever I want, I run towards. Run, run, run and go and get it. Before you get it, I have to get it. That is the pressure. And the other one is nivritti based pursuits. First to run towards, and then I run towards it. And then initially I like it, and after that, what? Stay away from me. Yes, you carry a spray bottle. <laughs> no. Stay away from me. I want to run away as fast as my legs would carry. Because that same thing which was an object of love has become an object of fear, has become an object of hate, has become an object of misunderstanding, has become an object of disappointment. 
Object means people also. Okay, yeah. But the object is inert, no? Object, event, people, things, circumstances, everything is included here. So the whole life goes like this. I run towards something and I say, I have been wanting this for 10 lifetimes. I have to get it right. <laughs> and in the 11th life, you finally got it. And then you are, what is it? Hot potato. I can't hold it. I have to drop it. Here, let me throw it to you. <laughs> this is what it is. And two kinds of pursuits are mentioned because that is what the world is obsessed with. Everybody in the world. You see the people, they are running towards something. Limited edition iPhone. Which is the current iPhone now? 15? 15 or what? Eugene is a useless place. They don't keep up with all the... They don't keep up with all the... Uh, what's the word for it? Technological developments. Too much vairagya is here. This passion. But elsewhere, I think it is 15. Let's say it's 15. So then they then they will say limited edition of what comes after 15. iPhone 16 is here. Sweet 16. <laughs> There's only this many. Meaning, come and get it. <laughs> what do you see the people doing? Rushing towards. Rushing towards this apple shop. Not fruit, okay? <laughs> At least if you go to the fruit, you'll get a whole apple. Here, the bite is taken out. <laughs> Half bitten apple shop. <laughs> you go there, you stand in line, and then just before your you take a number, and before your turn comes, the last limited edition <laughs> is what gone by karma. Why importance? Yes, <laughs> this is pravritti based pursuit. Like that, so many things are there. People are into experiences. People are into objects. And the commercial, you know, the capitalism manufactures these experiences and objects for people to, quote-unquote, enjoy. Come and get this new thing. Wonderful. Have a go at this. Taste this. Free sample. Free sample? Oh, I'm there. Oh, but it has gluten. Doesn't matter. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> but after that, the stomach ache is also free. Okay. <laughs> because you're allergic. As soon as we hear the word free, something is unleashed. <laughs> Just make a beeline for that. And then in America, they have taken this free to new heights. 33% free. It will say on the box of Syria. <laughs> Even though it's called see real, I don't see what is real about it. Really. 33% free. 27% free. Then all these things attract. Everything becomes a unique experience, one of a kind, few of a kind, limited edition, custom made. No one else has it. That's what each person is told. One of a kind. And so, why are these experiences, these objects, these kinds of advertising, why is it so attractive? Because there is a sense of lack. And that sense of lack is a prasada, a present of Atma Adhyana, this Nidra. The projection is that I lack. I am insecure, I am incomplete without this. Therefore, having this object, person, thing, whatever it is, experience, will make me a better person, will make me more complete. This is not enough. What I have, is not enough. It's never enough. When will it be enough? 
And so all the experiences are hyped up and made more attractive than they are so that the already gullible jiva runs after it. And then, so this is Swarga Vibrama. Vibrama, double delusion. V means special delusion. What is special delusion? Like, uh, you know, we have in India, special pav bhaji. There is one pav bhaji, there is a dish. It's just bread and mashed vegetables. That's all it is. It's some kind of a seasoning. And they say it's special. I don't know what's special about it. Maybe it's made in butter. We don't know. <laughs> special. So like this. V means special delusion. Special objects of special delusion. Which continues this sleep. You see, that's why the samsara is called a cycle. The sleep continues because I'm... These are all so porific. They make me go to sleep again and again. And because of this special delusion, I am trapped. I have a sense of bondage. So Swargadi means special uh, heavenly delusions. Doesn't mean you have to go somewhere. What was the chocolate cake like? Oh, it's heavenly. Have you been to heaven? No. But then how do you know it's heavenly? It's out of this world. Have you been out of this world and lived to tell the tale? No. We still use these expressions. Swarga means anything that feels like it's out of this world, feels it is special. And anything other than you is finite. You are the infinite consciousness Enjoying the piece, pieces and fragments of the finite. And it's okay if you know it. If you don't know it, it's a travesty. Swargadi Vibrama. Swarga Moksha. Moksha. Then, then when it comes to spiritual pursuits, there also several delusions are standing there to greet us. Because... We have that same catch, kill, eat mentality that we have towards the things that are to be gained in life. Catch, kill, eat. Because the previous life of, uh, what is that, you know, predator, predatory animal, is still that samskara is still alive. Samskara means memory, is still alive. That's why even if, uh, you know, somebody asks, how did you do in the exam? You will say, I killed it. <laughs> even the, the lingo is the same. Everybody becomes that. Who was that who said, I came, I saw, I conquered? Who is that? Caesar? Yeah. Was that Julius Caesar? Yeah. The one who seizes is called Caesar. Okay, yeah. <laughs> seizes other people's lands and property. I came, I saw, I conquered. The same vritti is in all of us, in everybody, until one comes to this knowledge. I want to conquer, I want to make it mine. The whole world is divided into two mine and soon to be mine. This is how the world is left. Not yet mine, but soon to be mine. <laughs> And because of this, the spiritual pursuit is also vitiated by this pravritti nivritti tendency, rushing towards something and running away from something and wanting something badly, but not knowing what one is after. The Bhagavad Gita describes this very well. Yamimam Pushpitam Vacham Prabhadanti Avipashtitaha Vedavada Rataf Partha what is all this gobbledy gook? It is called Sanskrit. Okay, so in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a beautiful passage. Very wonderful passage. At least turn off that phone, whoever has it. So then, um, there's a wonderful passage. 
And that passage, in that passage, Lord Krishna says, if you don't know what you're seeking, and if you don't know how to seek it, you will be seeking for the wrong things. And you'll either seek for the wrong thing in the right places, or you'll seek for the right thing in the wrong places. <laughs> Both of which are a problem. And even if one wants spiritually, because I have a sense of bondage, oh, I can't stand it. And whatever I want, I'm not getting. That's why I feel bound. And whatever I want to get rid of, I'm not able to get rid of. That is why I feel bound. When one is chafing under this bondage, thinking it to be real. And then one sees a board. Freedom from bondage. Here. Ooh. <laughs> Here I come. And there the person is talking in a soft voice. Immediately, soft, slow voice. Immediately, it's very attractive. <laughs> they go sit down and the voice continues. The cause of bondage is money. Give me all your money. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even continue this with a straight face. <laughs> Freedom is yours. <laughs> you want dispassion? I'll give you dispassion. Give me all your money. You have dispassion. Immediate dispassion. Instant dispassion. So, like this, one falls under the spell of these sweet talking individuals. Flowery talk. Pushpitam vajam. Flowery talk. Yes, you are really bound. And you need me to save you. The savior psychology. Many theologies are there. They're depending upon the savior psychology. What do we say? You were never enslaved. So you don't need to be saved. Only if one is enslaved, you need to be saved. If you're not, if I'm not enslaved, why do I need you to save me? I don't need anybody. Save that for later. And <laughs> so therefore, I have to understand this. Otherwise, I come under the spell of flowery talk. Somebody promises something. And because the mind is tuned to instant gratification, somebody says, I'll give you instant moksha. <laughs> What will you do? <coughs> I will. People do this all the time. I'll bop you on the head with, gently, with a bunch of feathers, some feathers, peacock feathers. <laughs> Moksha is yours. No <laughs> one falls for that. Of course, it comes at a, for a fee. Air is free. Breathing happens on its own. Yet the person says, I'll teach you how to breathe out samsara and breathe in the moksha in a weekend and then charge you for that. Charge you for breathing. When the air is free and breathing, you know how to do. You've been doing it since birth for many, many lifetimes. One falls prey to that. Not that learning how to breathe is wrong. But that does not, he's not giving moksha. In fact, you are already free. The bondage is notional. There is no bondage. It is just like the cows who thought they were bound. I feel bound. Anything that you do helps you to get to the place of knowing that you are not bound. Everything is wonderful. Breathing is wonderful. Yoga is wonderful. Standing on the head, we always encourage anything that brings blood flow to the head so that we can think clearly. That is wonderful. Seva is wonderful. Everything is wonderful. But that is not what is going to give you moksha because that is just another action. What does action give? Results of action. What kind of results of action? Finite results of action. What is moksha? 
my infinite nature that's already me. So the finite results of action are not going to produce the infinite simply because the infinite is not a product, never a product, cannot be a product. But here I still fall for this, these kinds of get moksha quick schemes because I don't know what moksha is. And I take the bondage to be real. The Upanishad says this very nicely. This verse is so important. It comes in the um, Katha Upanishad and the Mundaka Upanishad. In two Upanishads it comes. Swayam Panditaha Manyamanaha. They have them, themselves, these leaders, so called leaders, have given themselves the title of Pandits. Pandit title somebody else should give. But they themselves have said, we are the wise people. They themselves don't know. Avive, avive kinaha. They themselves don't have discrimination. Self-appointed God men, God women, leaders, whatever you want to call them. Unscrupulous. Like the blind leading the blind, they say, in the Upanishad. In the sense that if one doesn't know where one is going, one has to seek help. If one does not, one has the hubris not to seek help, then one cannot lead others. That is the idea. So, Pushpitam Vacham, the flowery talk. I come under the spell of the flowery talk. And I seek help from the wrong sources, from Sources who are themselves averse to seeking help. If the source where I seek help is seeking help, then it's, it's safe. But if the source itself refuses to seek help, then how can I get help from them? And then what happens is that Bahushakhaha Anantaha Cha Muddhayaha Abhyadasainam so when I come under the spell of wrong leadership, which thinks it knows everything without seeking help, under the spell of wrong, wrong leadership, my quest is incomplete. And because my quest is incomplete, it becomes many branches. It branches out into many, many things. Because I'm lost. And when I'm lost, what do I think? I think maybe this, maybe that. Maybe I'll try this. This is not enough. Maybe I need that. Maybe I want this. Maybe I should go here. Maybe I should go there. And I'm going all over the place. This is exactly what is described in the Bhagavad Gita. And so, Moksha Vibrama means two things. Varga Vibrama, we saw all kinds of worldly experiences in this world and in the afterlife. One is searching, one is seeking, one is falling prey to that and continuing this, this, the long sleep of ignorance, self-ignorance. Then even moksha is not left out. I thought, oh, to, to be free from this is my goal. Let me be free from this. How to be free from this? It's like a kitten playing with a ball of yarn. You leave a small kitten with the ball of yarn and go away out of the room and then come back after 15 minutes. The kitten has attained one nest with the ball of yarn. <laughs> you don't know where the kitten ends and where the yarn begins. And in the same way, here too, I think I can just play with these things, but then they end up playing with me. Because this sense of bondage, if I don't know, it is notional. I'll think it is real and I'll keep trying to get rid of it, keep trying to get rid of it. The more I get rid of it, the more karma and then karma phala, result of action and then much more karma and then much more karma phala. Like this, it keeps on being, it keeps on reproducing itself. And so this is moksha vibrama, two meanings. One is 
I do not know that I'm not bound. Therefore, I seek to be unbound, seek to become unbound, a very unbecoming pursuit. Second, since I don't know I'm not bound, I become prey to all kinds of quick fixes, instant gratifications, spiritual quote-unquote experiences, miracles, all these things. And this is also what Vibrahma. So here we cannot blame the Jagat. We cannot blame the God-made Jagat. The universe is simply what it is. And I have projected my own unconscious mind of desires, of wants, of don't wants, attractions, aversions, prejudices, preferences, and all these overlay over the universe that is already there, free of those projections. And because of these projections, I get trapped in the projections and don't know where to go. And therefore, what else to do? We'll continue to sleep. The sleep of <laughs> What else is there? When nothing works, let's go to bed. That's all it is, you know, because can't face the can't face being awake. So Ether means these two spuranti, these two are there, they manifest. What is that? Delusions, I am bound. Delusions, I have to get something in life. Delusions, therefore, I have to go here, go there. All these things, you know, they, they, they manifest. They manifest. I need enlightenment. You don't need enlightenment. You need to know that you are not ignorant. That's all it is. You need to let go of the ignorance. And for that, the knowledge helps. So, it's very interesting. So, then if you say, Moksha is also a delusion. Yes, it is a delusion. Then, then you can ask the question, what am I doing here? And why did you tell me this in the first class itself? I could have saved all this time. <laughs> if the pursuit of freedom is a delusion, what am I doing here? We have to see from which standpoint. From the standpoint that I am free, from when I understand that, then everything is a delusion. Everything is a projection. I don't need anything. Do I know that I'm already free? If I honestly ask myself, and if the answer comes no, then we need a pursuit. The pursuit is, 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 is mithya. Means it's a depends part of the dependent reality. It's like a, a wonderful painting or an embroidery on a, like a tapestry. There you see your whole life embroidered in skeins of colors, various colors. Sometimes it is gray and dull. Sometimes it is bright colors. There was a movie from Iran, very interesting, made of this traveling family of carpet weavers. And uh, they were not, they were like, they were going from place to place making carpets and selling the carpets. The mother-in-law did not get along with the daughter-in-law. And the mother-in-law did not get along with her husband either. And then, and then the, so many inner conflicts and strife, all that came out in the carpets. <laughs> So the daughter-in-law would weave in the night and then draw the figure of what looked like the mother-in-law <laughs> undergoing some torture. The mother-in-law would walk by the carpet and immediately understood what has happened. Quickly unravel that <laughs> and show the figure of the daughter-in-law dead, you know, <laughs> things like this. So it's like that. The whole life is like a tapestry. You recognize your own story. Ooh, here is my elementary school. <laughs> here is me going to the gates of the elementary school. Oh, oh there is this bully child. <laughs> it bullied me. It made fun of me. And now I'm in high school. 
Actually, it was not high at all. It was the lows of my life. <laughs> and then what? And then here, <laughs> marking another thing. Oh, here is marriage. Less said about that, the better. And then <laughs> here are my own children. <laughs> And they are also going to school. Can't wait for them to grow up and leave. And like this, you can see the whole tapestry. Here I am with a gray cloud, cloud above my head. <laughs> sad, 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 sad. And then, oh, what is that building? Gurukula. <laughs> In the tapestry. Gurukula means a place of learning. That I'm ever free, not bound. Ashram. And here is this stick figure, me, entering the ashram. And there there is another stick figure, Guru. <laughs> <laughs> and then what? And then there are many other stick figures, karma yogis. They are all <laughs> they're all doing seva. They're all listening. I too sit and listen. So many stick figures in a room, in a house, in a little building called Gurukula. And then what? Bell rings. Oh, did I get moksha? No, no, no. It's just time for lunch. Ashram <laughs> lunch bell has rung. <laughs> then what? Then I'm free. I, I graduated from the Gurukula <laughs> with distinction. <laughs> I'm free. Now this is where? In the tapestry. If we can talk about the tapestry of our own lives just like this, from the standpoint of being the witness, then it is fun. All I see is Bhagavan. My own parentage is Ishvara. I see the presence of the Lord and the Goddess in my own parentage. I see that the karma is inevitable because it's in the tapestry. I see that. I see that this is how the life would have gone. There's nothing else I could have done. And because this is how it was. I see the inevitability of many things. In that inevitability is included my own regrets, my own joys, my own expectations, my own fears, my own tears. Everything is included in this tapestry, which I can watch from a distance, appreciate for what it is, with very little overlay of my own subjectivity. Oh, but aren't the tears subjectivity? Yes, but I have Ishwarized the tears. I have seen the tears as the manifestation of the psychological order of the Lord. So in that case, they don't become my tears. It's not even my mind. It's not even my bondage. It's not even my sorrow. It's not my anger. It is all in the scheme of things. It's the psychological order. Pardon me. Given this background, growing up in this background, that this child will have anger issues. This is ordained. It's a law. It's the psychological order. You can't do anything about it. You can take care of the anger, but it's not your fault. Interestingly, the anger is taken care of by divesting from it, not attaching to it, by able to look at it with love and dispassion like we saw in the last class. So I see the psychological order in this tapestry called my own jagat, meaning my own life. A small little slice of the jagat is my life, a minuscule slice. And I see the workings of this flawless, infallible, order, series of orders, the karmic order, the anatomical order, so many orders, the biological order, the physiological order, 
<laughs> botanical order. I see that. In that itself, I am redeemed. That space itself is the space of freedom, of redemption. The conscious this divestment from that which doesn't belong to me. This Jagat is what? Manifestation of Ishvara. Let me keep it that way. Why am I owning it up? And this is how I come out of this long and apparently endless dream. This is verse number 19. No, verse number 18. Now verse number 19 says, not content with taking us to this high level, the author wants us to go higher still. <laughs> jada jada vibhagaha ayam. Ayam vibhagaha. This division. Between what? Jada. Jada means lifeless, insentient. Ajada. Sentient. This Distinction between sentient and uh, insentient. I am vibhagaha mayi in me kalpitaha is imagined in me. What kind of me? Ajade mayi in me the sentient one is imagined this distinction in me the imaginary distinction between the sentient and the insentient subsists exists. What's wrong with that? That's how we came to Vedanta. Dvauhi padarthav. One is Atma. There are two things in the universe. One is Atma. The other one is what? No. An Atma. Not I. I and not I. I am unlike everything else in the universe and I am sentient and everything else that I objectify is insentient. This is the bread and butter of Vedanta. This is how I came to Vedanta. And with great difficulty, now that I have that routine memorized, you want to take that away from me now. <laughs> Just now I have understood that I am sentient, everything else is insentient. And then now you are saying that this is all an imaginary, sentient, insentient is an imaginary dichotomy. It's a dyad that is as though superimposed upon that which is free of this division. So are you saying, you can ask, are you saying the Atma is insentient? Nobody said that. Oh, so you are saying Atma is sentient. It does not really matter. Because the insentient, sentient distinction matters only when there is a misidentification. Right? Mm -hmm. The misidentification with the insentient. Think body is sentient or insentient? Insentient. Mind is sentient or insentient? Insentient. Emotions are sentient or insentient? Insentient. The intellect, the buddhi is sentient or insentient? Insentient. Yet what do I do? Me body, me buddhi, me mind, not even my mind. I mind, <laughs> I buddhi, I body. There is a mix up. So, what does what do we do? We separate in order to unite. You can't just stop at the separation. So, from the standpoint of this author, this uh, this uh, division we have uh, going, which we have by hearted, sentient and insentient. Is actually Vedanta baby talk. Gu gu ga ga. <laughs> this was okay then. Why? Because there was a mix up. Now, as we come to the close of the text, this mix up should no longer be there. Or even if it is there, I'm aware of the fact that it is there. So that means what? Even this distinction between the sentient and the insentient. I question and let it go. I query this distinction. How do you query the distinction? 
because you understand it from the standpoint, from which standpoint it is made. I cognize something as insentient so that I don't get mixed up in it and I don't claim what is not I as I. In the beginning, it is of the quest. In the beginning of the study, it is very, very important because of this mix-up, sorrow, pain, etc. are there. So therefore, I have to separate and be able to look and say, I'm the witness, I'm the sentient one. And everything that is insentient is not me. I'm not the sum total of this body. I'm more than this body. I'm the sentience that abides in this body. I'm not the mind. I'm the sentience that lends its presence to the mind. I'm not the, what else is left, to, you know, the intellect. I'm the sentience that blesses the intellect and allows it to function. I'm not the sense organs. So I am that sentience which blesses the sense organs to function in their capacities. Within this whole vast order where even disorder is included in the order. The order that transcends disorder. Very beautiful. This I have to know and that's why the distinction is made. So supposing we have, let's say, in the world, there was no, the color black did not exist at all, let us say. Do you have to distinguish it from white? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> the color itself is not there. Only when that color is there, you have to say this is different. We make a distinction, color white, between black and white. Why? Because we want to distinguish between the two. But here there is no two. There are no two entities. There is only sentience. And that too I can't call it sentience. <laughs> because the Atma has no name. Even the word Satchidananda, they are like a sign that points. Sometimes you see a sign and the sign says restaurant. And then it has an arrow. What do you do when you see the sign? You go towards it. You go in the direction of the arrow. <coughs> because you know, if you walk in that direction, you will fulfill your hunger. You will fill up with, with the food in the restaurant. The, the guide post, the sign post, saying restaurant that way, with an arrow. You can't stand there and start eating it. That's not the point. <laughs> right? So here too, satyam, jnanam, anantam, this I, which is self-existent, self-lit, self-luminous, self-evident, this self-evident I, which illumines everything else in the universe, which cognizes everything, we say, is. The is is not I. The is is a signboard which indicates the I. Lakshyartha, indirectly, by implication. And what kind of an is is it? Is it a dead is? No, no, no. It is sentient. <laughs> The isness is not dead. It is very much alive because I know I am alive and so the isness is alive. The second board is also an indicator. And how long does this isness and this aliveness last? Eternal. Uh, ananta, ananda, that is the third sign board. So sign board, these are all indications. They all point to the self-evident me. They point to me who is self-evident, self-effulgent. So therefore, I understand the truth of myself. And after I understand the truth of myself, do I have to go and memorize the signboards? No. That is exactly the distinction between sentient and insentient. In the beginning of the quest, we have two signs. Sentient, this way, <laughs> insentient, <laughs> that way. <laughs> but 
Shreyas, Shreyas, <laughs> two pursuits. The pursuit of everything in sentient and finite is called prayas. Why is it called prayas? Because those who go after it are saying pray for us. Yes. <laughs> prayas. And the pursuit of the, the, the truth of myself as the, the nature of this sentience is called shreyas, the most exalted one. Prayas means delightful. Shreyas means the most exalted. The most exalted pursuit includes the delightful. But the delightful is time bound, does not include the exalted one. This is what we don't understand. And so therefore, we take these indicators to be ironclad distinctions. They are just there to indicate. They are little signposts on the way. Sentience, this way, <laughs> insentient, that way. And then we think they are two different things. In the beginning, we have to think that way. What else to do? Because well, there is a whole mix-up. And taking the not I for the I is the cause of tremendous sorrow and confusion. So I have to drop the not I. But the not I baby that has been dropped is now to be embraced. Everything is I alone. That's why in the holiest, one of the holiest chants called Sri Rudram, the first portion is what? Not me, not me, not me, everything is you, not me, not me, not me. And then everything is described. The rains, the leaves that are dry, the leaves that are green, and everything in between is all you, it's not me. And then the next part, this is called Namaka. And the next part is that everything is me alone. That is the completion. Because if you say not me, there is a difference between me and not me. In the next portion of this chant, everything is owned up as I. This is all me. This is all me. This is me. And that's how the, the, the poets uh, the, who channel the Vedas, that is how they chant. The rishis who channel the Vedas, that is what they say. There is one Devi Sukta. I am the air that I breathe. I am the sun. I am the fire. I am the mountains. I am that which crawls. I am that which creeps. I am that which includes everything that is insentient. The insentient is not away from me. The insentient, sentient distinction is an arbitrary distinction, which is a pedagogical technique to be able to resolve this mix-up. And once this mix-up is resolved, I can't go about with this new understanding and say, oh, this is all, you know, I, I, have, I, I am sentient, so I'm superior. And this thing is, the rock is insentient and you are inferior. If the rock could talk, you, it, and if you said, please tell me your life history, it would put you to shame. It will say, long ago I was a forest. <laughs> and I have, I have been living here for billions of years. It will put your own sad little life story to shame. What sentient? What insentient? It's all me. And so this owning up is ha happening here in this verse. And one is being goaded to take everything as an extension of oneself. And so what is that here? Jada ajada vibhagaha ayam. This distinction between sentient and insentient is kalpita, is, is but uh, imagined within me. What kind of a me? The me that is all sentient. Then a question can come, even before we go to the next line, the question can come. What is the question? How can, okay, if I am all sentience, how can I give birth to the insentient? <laughs> how can I do that? There must be some problem here. How can I give birth to the insentient when I'm sentient? Thankfully, there are many, many different examples for that. 
Do you have hair? Yes. Or at least you can say I used to. Okay. And... <laughs> Do you have names? Yes. Is hair sentient or insentient? Insentient. Names are sentient or insentient? Insentient. That's why if you go have a haircut, you don't need to go under general anesthesia to get a haircut. Because you don't feel anything. Cut, 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 gone. Same thing. When you cut your nails, you don't have to put local anesthesia. Why? It's insentient. Are you sentient or not? Yes. <laughs> So how out of you the insentient nails and the insentient hair has come? Uh, I don't know. Okay, then keep quiet. So that, <laughs> that shows that even out of the sentient, insentient can come. Even out of insentient, sentient can come. Like you put a uh, seed uh, underground. Is the earth sentient or insentient? Insentient. Just to show you how arbitrary this distinction is. Out of the earth, plant comes. Plant is sentient or insentient? Sentient. See? So many examples. All from the Mundaka Upanishad. Ha Urna Nabhihi. Woolly navel. What is that? Spider. <laughs> The woolly navelled one, Srijate Grinhate, it, it, uh, it creates its own little string and then it creates its universe, the material from which the web is made. And we are not talking of WWW, okay? Worldwide <laughs> web, we are not talking. We are literally talking spider. Because now web has come to mean many different things. So it makes the web, it retracts the web. Yatha Prithivyam Oshadhayaha Sambhavanti. Just out of the so called insentient earth, the sentient plant world thrives and survives. So much so that if you uproot the plant from the insentient earth, it will die. Yatha Sataf Purushat Keshalomani. Like the nails and the hair. From the sentient person, insentient things have come. Tatha aksharat sambhavati iha vishvam. Similarly, out of this has as though come this whole universe, which you are now calling insentient from, from that source of sentient alone. So there is no, this, this distinction is absolutely arbitrary and must be retracted as soon as its pedagogical function is done. More we'll see in the evening class. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namadachyate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Yonamaha Harihi Om